Uh, hello and welcome to another lecture by the Political Theory SOC of IAPS. Uh, today's lecture is one that I've personally been really looking forward to. It's about the, the Me Too movement and women veterans in the US Army. The presenter today is Jessica Cross. She's a PhD candidate from uh, the University of Connecticut in political science. And she is also a member of the Political Theory SOC. Uh, Jessica, we are really looking forward to this. All right, um, welcome everybody. I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see here. Can everybody see this? Yes. All right, awesome. So um, this lecture is based off a paper I'm working on um, called The Wrong Enemy, How the Me Too Movement Failed Women Veterans. Um, it is a US focused study paper right now. I might try to find another country to incorporate, but right now um, I haven't gotten to that point. This also focuses on all branches of the US military, not just uh, the army, even though I'm pretty sure that everybody sees them as the same. A um, little bit of a content warning. This lecture will talk about rape, sexual assault. There will be statistics discussed, um, violence in general against women. And as a disclosure, I am a uh, combat veteran from the US Iraq war. I served on the USS Shiloh during the start of the war um, in 2003. So um, some of this material is my own lived experience and knowledge that comes from that. So I'm gonna start today's lecture talking about a case that um, many people in the US are familiar with, other people outside might not be. Um, this is the case of Vanessa Gillian. She went missing in April of 2020 from her command. And that was uh, Fort Hood in Texas, United States. Um, she was actually brutally murdered by one of her colleagues, by a male soldier that had sexually harassed her in the past. Um, and the problem with her case was the army did its normal we're not gonna really talk about it in the public. Um, and they were very vague with her family about what was happening in the search for her remains because she was missing under mysterious circumstances. Um, when she went missing, her keys, her ID, her phone were all in her workspace when she went missing. So it was um, suspicious circumstances to say the least. So after uh, months, Months of searching, uh, the actor Selma Hayek got word of this and made an Instagram post about searching for her. And it was quickly picked up by the New York Times. And this was in June timeframe. Because of this, uh, there were protests outside the Fort Hood gate. Um, people really wanted to know what happened to her. And the investigation found that um, her remains were actually found near the base, buried in three separate locations by the river. Um, her murderer and his girlfriend um, tried to burn her at first. And since they weren't able to do that, they dismembered her and buried her in three separate locations. The investigation found several levels of failure amongst the chain of command. And, you know, just so you all don't worry, just like uh, Louis CK, their careers are fine. They got moved to other commands. They're cool. Um, Vanessa's family now receives death benefits and a gate was named after her uh, near her uh, location on base where she worked. And sexual harassment was added as a crime in the Uniform Code of Military Justice in 2022. Um, and that that's it's kind of an irony because uh, the things that are against the uniform code of military justice are things such as uh, adultery. That was illegal in the military, but sexual harassment was not a crime until after she died. Um, so for this paper, the research question was mostly gonna be what caused the disconnect between the military sexual trauma survivors and the Me Too movement. And when you look at the statistics of military sexual violence, it has increased in 
number of reports um, steadily since they started recording it in 2004. And these crimes flourish in an environment where sexual innuendo, gender-based bullying, unfair treatment, low expectations, and fundamental disrespect for women are allowed to flourish. Fixing this culture problem at the Department of Defense is the job of its leaders at all levels. Um, they are still not really doing it. Um, and here are a few statistics on women in the military for the US. There are 1,333-ish active duty military members of which 17% are women. Of, of the sexual assaults, um, which were 20,500, and this is based on 2018 reports, these years are, these reports are generally a couple years behind because they involve uh, data from surveys and the such. Um, so active duty members, uh, 13,000 of the reported assaults were women and 7,500 were men. This was a 40% increase from 2016, and the rate for women increased over 50%. There may be a correlation with the um, election of Donald Trump. I this That was not part of the study, but um, anecdotally, I noticed an increase of complaints from friends who are still in the military. Um, of women who reported penetrative sexual assault, 59% were uh, assaulted by a higher ranking person and 24% were assaulted by someone in their direct chain of command. And uh, for those who aren't aware of US military structure, it is very uh, chain of command oriented. You have to report it to your chain of command before you report it to anyone else. Um, and if you go outside of your chain of command to report sexual assault, you will be, there will be retaliation. Um, in a lot of ways. So uh, women who reported it, uh, let's see, they estimate that 76% 70, are unreported and 24% of active duty women will experience sexual harassment in their career. So despite the increase in reports, conviction rate has decreased by 80%. 4% of reported sexual assaults were tried and 8% were convicted, 0.8% of those tried were convicted. So we're talking about a teeny, tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny fraction of sexual assaults that are even brought to trial. And if they are such a small percent is even convicted of them. 25% of those surveyed did not report due to fear of retaliation. Um, a full third of survivors are discharged within seven months of making a report. And as a little factoid here is 90%, 99% of the offenders are male, 91% of the victims are female. And that is the reason for, and I want to point out that males do have, do get sexually assaulted and it's more often than not by another male. And when they report, they have to deal with a greater amount of retaliation than women because military culture in the US is extremely, is the epitome of toxic masculinity. And so this, this paper is mostly in regards to women's assaults, um, just as an FYI. So the major consequence is, is how many leave the military within seven months of reporting. That's an awful short amount of time. Um, most people, when they initially enlist, it's for four years. And say you get assaulted within your second or third year, you're not gonna finish your contract. This means women are being discharged prior to the end of their contract, and they are more likely to have an unfavorable discharge than the rest of the military population. And that's because they are often diagnosed with mood disorders instead of PTSD. Um, they're often dis discharged for schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, any number of things that uh, they probably do not have. Now, because of their discharge until recently, um, the military used to not allow people with certain discharges to use the, the VA system for medical care. 
Um, and that includes people with certain medical discharges because they do get bad conduct discharges associated with some of these medical discharges because um, PTSD does cause a lot of mood problems. Um, now, because of this, fewer females will attain the higher ranks in the military. Fewer females qualify retirement. And it did impact females um, unequally when it came to qualifying for VA care if they had an uh, unfavorable discharge. These females also face uh, civilian consequences. If you have a certain discharge, you can't get certain jobs. Um, you will be denied employment based on your discharge, uh, whatever your discharge code is, if it's a bad discharge. Um, according to the DOD, sexual violence is one of the greatest problems that threatens unit cohesion, good order and discipline, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's also the cost of treating PTSD. I know I have a lot of female friends who are 100% disabled because of their PTSD from sexual assault. So it's not really a small consequence when it comes to healthcare in the US, especially when you consider how expensive healthcare is in the US. Um, now, why are women even in the military if they don't want us there? I mean, that's a question, right? Women, at, women were added to the military ranks after Vietnam, when the US started to transition from professional military to a professional military force from a conscripted one. Um, this was in an effort to tamp down anti-war protesters. And as you can see from the 20 years in Iraq with a volunteer military, there's, there doesn't seem to be as much protesting. Um, now, initially when we were Put, implemented, it was administrative and nursing roles. And eventually we filled basically any role defined as non-combat, which is a kind of loose definition. Um, non-combat doesn't mean far away from combat. Uh, nurses have been on the front lines for decades. Uh, so, you know, non-combat roles is kind of a slippery term. We've always been in combat, just not classified as such. Women have been in combat ships since the 1990 Gulf War. And this is something I remember because I remember watching this on the news and they were talking about the first missiles launched and how that was the first ship with combat ship with women on it in the Navy. So it's like a very clear adolescent memory for me. Um, we are now fully integrated into the military, into most professions. There's still a little bit of uh, resistance when it comes to special forces and the like. But I know that um, I believe we're starting to get integrated even on the submarine service, which was all male before. Now, why a professional military? Why not just still use conscripts? A lot of countries do. Um, studies have shown that a professional military will, will commit fewer war crimes. There's a greater unit cohesion slash purpose for what they're fighting for. And it turns the military into a viable career option and improves public sentiment when it comes to the military. So where are we going? Sorry, guys. All right, fine, I'll fight you. So this is not advancing, there we go. Sorry. Um, so the Me Too movement was started in 2006 by Tarana Burke. And she did it as a way to show how widespread sexual violence is against women. It was a way to express solidarity with other survivors. And it also acts as a way of removing that feeling of shame that most survivors have because of gaslighting and the patriarchy. Um, and it was brought again into popular conversation in 2017. Um, Alyssa Milano, I believe was the one who initially started using it. And because of the Me Too movement at that time, several high profile members of the media faced accounting for their actions. Uh, some of them are making quote comebacks. So we can discuss the um, permanence of this movement maybe later, but there were four society, this, this movement overall forced societies to have that uncomfortable conversation about how widespread the nature of sexual misbehavior is um, and the literature on social movements um, 
says that, uh, you know, defines a social movement as a collective challenge to elites by people with common interests, solidarity and solidarity. Um, it's a sustained effort of lobbying and interaction with the elites and other stakeholders in order to enlist beneficial change. Um, in 1971, Olson countered that contrary to popular belief, a large group of rational self-interested actors will not act to advance their shared mutual interests without coercion or a separate incentive offered individually that's, that still forces them to have a shared burden in the group's outcome. And um, even with unanimous consent within this group, um, and that's concerning methods and organization and other um, goals, uh, this is still, this still holds true. Now, if you look at US military women as a whole, it is a large diverse group and it's dispersed across the globe. Um, we are in commands at, at small numbers and larger numbers, depending on the size of the command and the availability for um, people to be there. So I've been at commands where there's only been 30 women. Or actually, no, when I was in Greece, there was like 10 of us. So there's only 10 women at the command. It's a very small group at the local level but organizing as a large group, as a military, as the whole, is difficult to do because of deployments. Uh, culture is very anti-feminist in the military, um, obviously, or maybe not obviously, but, um, and Bates in 1997 wants to focus on the constraints to shaping movement behavior over choice. So even if women, did want to mobilize in the military, and a lot of them probably do. Um, there are a lot of constraints for them, both political and practical. And you know, there's a there's a large importance when it comes to the mobilizing structures itself, when it comes to a woman's movement or any movement in general. So if there's no mobilizing structure or lattice work essentially for a social movement to exist, it makes it harder for it to exist. so many difficulties with this. So um, feminist literature says military, uh, this is a quote from Cynthia Enloe, militarization and the privileging of masculinity are both the products not only of amorphous cultural beliefs, but also of deliberate decisions. Um, what the military does is deliberate decisions in pretty much everything. So when it comes to feminist mobilization, Swank and Foss theorize that there are several factors that come into effect when it comes to, I'm trying to move this window out of my way. Oh, there we go. Um, in feminist mobilization. So uh, education is the largest factor they found in their study. Um, and one thing you want to look at in military members as a whole, the enlisted ranks is primarily up to a high school education in the, and um, there needs to be a feminist consciousness. And as a survivor of the US public school system, there's not too much of a feminist consciousness, consciousness um, really uh, uh, nurtured in the K through 12 age group in the public school system anyway. Emotional affinity to feminist, as I mentioned before, the military is highly anti-feminist. Um, being a woman is looked down upon. Uh, women are seen, they uh, attribute typical traits to feminism. Um, they call, you know, they go with the Glenn Beck route of feminazis. It's, they're not, it's not pleasant. Um, and there needs to be group measure, men, membership. And as women, you have a membership, but culturally uh, women are kind of pitted against each other in the military in a lot of ways. And there also need to be pre-existing mobilizing networks, which I've mentioned before, do not exist within the military, really, when it comes to, uh, we'll call them um, civic rights. Um, 
Now, according to Feynman, the feminization of the military industrial complex or pinkwashing um, is why she doesn't see uh, uh, organizing with other military members. Um, there's also an argument against elevating military service as a higher class of citizenship, which is something we are extremely guilty of in the United States. Um, and women should not be fighting for advancement in the ranks. They should be fighting to abolish the military. And the sentiment is generally a woman who is being bombed does not care that the pilot who launched it was a woman. That doesn't empower her. Um, and in the end, it doesn't really empower the pilot, if you think about it. Now, these are all legitimate arguments against the military industrial complex. Um, oops, fighting with me again. Um, but they ignore the military to poverty pipeline. It, it ignores the predatory tactics of military recruiters in the United States. We are oftentimes, um, recruiters are allowed into schools at an increasingly younger age um, and it promotes positive impressions of the military and it helps with militarization. And recruiters are also frequently in high schools actively recruiting people for military service. And it also ignores the fact that black women in the US are over um, representative, represented in the military ranks. While black women make up, I believe 12% of the US population, they make up um, some 28% of the military population, of the military, of the population of military women. And there's something to be said about the high rate of black women having student loans and the women joining the military for college education. It's a very predatory relationship. Um, this discourse also ignores the autonomy of women to defend the state that they live in and to make their own choices. It ignores the reasons women join the military. Um, Money for college is the biggest reason people join the military in the US, um, which is why they won't forgive student loans probably. Um, <laughs> and it also ignores the fact that women might join the military because they have a patriotic desire to do so. And instead of seeing military veterans that are women as the enemy to feminist movements, they should see them as potential allies. Um, a good deal of military women are anti-war. They are willing to pull back the curtain on military violence, both inside and outside the ranks. Um, they lend legitimacy, not because their hands are clean like other feminists, but because they have direct knowledge and experience of the military industrial complex. And they can um, kind of do a... Uh, it legitimizes the discourse against it instead of saying, you don't know because you've never served. Now we have people who have served for good or bad. Um, now, just as a background, the research design, it's a qualitative case study of the Me Too movement and military sexual violence in the US. And um, I won't go too far into it to save time, but there's the list of primary and secondary sources used for this research. Sorry. Um, now, there are four primary factors that explain the reluctance of feminist groups to engage with military women that I found in my research. Um, active duty military, military members face restrictions on public discourse. Um, you can't protest in uniform. Um, the military is supposed to appear to be apolitical in the United States. There are things that you aren't allowed to report on for various um, security reasons. For example, if you're in a secure, like if you're in a place that is not reported on and it happens, you know, there's a lot of, they do a lot of uh, redacting in the name of, of uh, national security. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, there are very few resources for military sexual trauma survivors outside the military industrial complex. 
There is no organized network for advocacy inside the military or not one that's reliable. Um, there is a large geographic dispersal for military women, uh, global. Victim blaming is perhaps one of the other larger causes behind this. Uh, there's a tendency to ask why women would join the military and what do you expect being with men? Um, former President Trump is probably one of the lar most famous people to tweet such a thing. And unfortunately, the commander in chief of the military for four years. Um, so behind the victim blaming, there's also the what were they drinking? What were they wearing? Um, did you smile at them? I don't know. The usual victim blaming um, book of uh, actions. And in the US, we have a problematic fetishization of the US military and hero worship. And that turns into um, a lot of times invalidating the service of women because it's very uncomfortable for civilians to discuss the specifics of sexual assault in the military, I'll say. I've actually had people um, get really upset when I tell them, when they ask why I left the military and I say, you know, all the rape, um, they get a little upset about it um, and defensive. And it's, it's interesting because it's not their, per you know, it, they don't know the person. I don't know. It's weird. Um, and there is the solid anti-war stance, which is completely and utterly acceptable by feminist groups. Um, I actually agree with the anti-war stance. Um, but as a realist, I understand that we have to have the military for now. <laughs> and having an anti-war stance doesn't really do much to help the women who are being sexually assaulted. Um, now, there are a lot of implications to this. Um, technically, sexual offenders are not placed on sexual offender lists when they get charged in the military. They aren't put on civilian lists. So they oftentimes leave the military and continue their predatory behavior as civilians. Non-judicial punishment, which is the most common method of dealing with sexual violence, usually leaves no impact on your civilian arrest record. And many, and that's because many items published um, punishable under the military code of uniform ju justice, like adultery, they're not actually laws, but military regulations and norms. Um, this, in my eyes, implies that the state does not value women. Um, and that is in large part because when military members, not only when they may rape their colleagues, they also rape women off of base. And it is a very well, if they didn't have um, a brothel available to them, then what do you expect attitude about it? And it's similar to the attitude that they have when it comes to women inside the ranks being raped. It's, it's a thing to behold, it, especially when you take into account how much it costs to train and pay each military member in the US. Um, we're one of the most expensive militaries in the world and it's for a reason. Um, and there are many avenues for future, re future resource on this topic. I, I find that there's many similarities between how sexual assault is handled on college campuses and in the military in the US, um, both initially male only institutions. So it, it shows a reluctance to allow females to be part of the institution itself. Um, black women are vastly overrepresented, overrepresented demographically in the US military. And they're also the largest group holding debt, college debt in the US, um, as I mentioned before. So there's several connections to be made given to the GI Bill, which is the military's program to fund college for people who served. There's further research into understanding groups with heavy militarization um, and sexual assault, first responders, mainly police. Um, these are groups that we don't 
feminists don't engage with because they're seen as agents of the state. And while they're agents of the state, they also undergo their own oppression. So it's um, a tricky topic, understandably, but we could use further research into the federal police services, um, the departments of Homeland Security with particular attention to the Coast Guard, ICE, Border Patrol, et cetera. And I think, um, you know, for expanding the research, my, my biggest problem is trying to think of another national military with an all volunteer force with this sort of dynamic that we have in the US. Maybe South Korea might be similar, even though that's not an all volunteer military, but they do have a re-emerging um, male, what do they call them? men's rights groups or something. They have an emerging men's rights movement there. Um, so I think the attitude might be similar, um, but there's a, you know, I have to really look at something that I can have a, as equal a comparison to the US military as possible to involve another country in their reaction to me too. So it's the last slide. So there we go. Um, that is the end of the presentation. If anybody has any questions, comments. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it was quite heavy because of the concept, but it was also very, very interesting. Um, so I personally have so many questions, uh, but if anyone else would like to go first, that would be great. You can either type your question or you can open your mic and just ask. Maybe I can start and we can we can take it from there. So I have very limited knowledge of the of the US Army and how it functions. So if I ask something that you <laughs> consider a little bit Dumb, my apologies in advance. Um, so my first question is, I, I noted them down as you were presenting, so they will go through through the slides. Um, so it's on the very first slide, I think, with the murder of, of Vanessa uh, Gillen. And is there a link between her going missing and then all finding her body after her murder? And then murder being added to the UCMJ? Like, was it a direct result? Was it just that? So sex, and it, you're referring to um, sexual harassment being, being added to the UCMJ. Um, yes, it was a direct result of her murder because was she was sexually harassed by the man who murdered her and she reported it and the command didn't do a proper follow-up. Oh, and then oh. she ended up being murdered. So her murder was the reason that that bill finally got passed. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, um, she was one of the women who ran for president a few cycles ago. Um, she was the driving force behind getting any legislation passed. She'd been working on it for 10 years. Um, she, it, it, took, it, it took her 10 years to get enough male senators on board with any legislation really protecting women. It's been a struggle for a while. There was no political will to do it. I, I can imagine. So it took, and, and unfortunately it took the murder of a beautiful young woman to say, maybe we shouldn't be sexually harassing our colleagues. Perhaps, that would be a good call, yeah. Um, then you mentioned retaliation, and of course it makes sense when you think about it, even if you think about anecdotal evidence. When, when you think about it. And retaliation is something is reported out of someone's chain of command. Um, is that based on socialized behaviors in the army or are there actually rules and regulations that talk about punishment if something is reported out of someone's chain of command? Both. Oh. Um, because the military recommends that things are handled at the lowest possible level in the chain of command. 
So if you go out, say if you go outside, and there are people in a command structure that are meant to be outside of it, like the chaplain, um, he's outside of the chain of command. You can go to him or her. Um, the command, there's usually, for the Navy, it's called the command master chief. Um, they are outside of your direct chain of command, but part of it. So you can last resort if your chain of command doesn't resolve something, you can go to them. But if you don't go to your chain of command first, there will be retaliation, not in the legal sense, but in the, your, for example, your uh, evaluations will be lower. You'll be given shittier side duties. Guess who's getting the mid watch from now on? Um, it's, it's, you know, uh, guess who gets bumped, accidentally bumped into off the side of the ship? You know, like it, it's, <laughs> They, Vanessa shows that they aren't above killing women to silence them in the military. Um, and then later on, you mentioned that um, those who get assaulted, um, you didn't specify if that's just for women or for like, men as well, but generally people who experience assault, they leave the military sooner, like before they finish their contract, do they opt sometimes to leave or is it always a discharge, like a dishonorable discharge? Are there well, statistics always, on this? There, there's a lot of subtlety in there because it depends on when in their service they're diagnosed. Because if you're diagnosed within the first year or two of your service, they'll go, oh, it's a pre-existing condition. So, and they'll use that against you in your discharge. Um, but if you're like, say a decade in, they can't be like, oh, it's a pre-existing condition. But you, the trick is making it that far. Um, because, and, the, and some of it is probably voluntary because, you know, F this, uh, you know, if they're gonna process you out, why, pro why fight it? Um, and it's because, you know, there's something that they discuss in a lot of the literature called a moral injury, which is where victims of sexual assault are injured twice in a way, um, where the assault itself is a moral injury. But how the, the chain of command that you were told you're supposed to trust in these situations handles it, and it's usually poorly, that is a second injury because it causes a deep distrust and hatred of the institution. And I can assure you that's really, you know, deeply embedded. <laughs> I have I have four more questions, five-ish, but maybe someone else would like to, to ask something now. Oh. Let me get back. So it's a question by Nero. Um, if military, my question would be if military structures without hierarchy would be possible because most of the examples have shown that gap of power and hierarchical structures existing between victim and aggressor. So would military be possible without having hierarchy? So this is so this is something that was passed after Vanessa's death. Um, they and this is something. Um, Senator Gilderbrand had been working on for some time actually, was to remove the chain of command from sexual assault cases. Now, they haven't started implementing it yet and its success is, depends on the willingness of commanding officers to play along. And I say that because that might be a power they aren't so willing to let go of. Um, because a commanding officer, when it comes to criminal punishment, we'll, we'll just call it criminal punishment, is the one that decides what to charge. They have complete autonomy over the system. So if, and I question how these reports are going to be made, like if the report is going to get out of the chain of command, because that's the problem. It stays in the chain of command. And an example that I know of from my, my career is there was a guy that a friend of mine found some violent pornography. We'll just 
on someone else's laptop they left in the shop. And he showed it to their chief, who is their next person, chain of command. And the chief took the laptop and threw it over the side of the ship. So, and, and, and the problem is, is how isolated military units are within their own world, especially if it's a deployed unit. Because if you're in the middle of the Persian Gulf, your entire world is that ship or that army unit or you know air force you know whatever you're deployed with that is your world and it's really in communication um i don't know what it's like now granted um but i do know that if you are in a classified area your internet's not going to be on um your emails are going to be red um because they don't want you giving away secrets um they have a problem with that for some reason um so i don't know what the system is going to be what they're going to do to go around those sorts of limitations i am glad they're they're attempting something finally but i'm not convinced of its success rate <laughs> because yes ideally getting around that hierarchy would solve a lot of these problems because the upper chain of command never really knows what the lower chain of command is up to fully, which allows for greater battle autonomy, which is great for us winning stuff, but it's not great when it comes to uh, human rights violations. Before we go to the next question, Noah, do you have a follow-up? Oh, was that? Mm, thank, thank you for the response of the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Lisa? Yeah, um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was really, really interesting. Um, one thing, I, I know the sexual harassment, is, it's relatively new being added to the books, but since you've been following it, a lot of women who've been discharged after they've made allegations of rape or sexual assault or even sexual harassment have been discharged with uh, using adultery. Like you said, on the books, they get discharged with the fact that they apparently committed adultery. Um, do you oh. know if this would be any moves towards well, they I guess, getting their military benefits back? Yes, um, there have been moves towards that. Um, one of the things they're doing is allowing them to go use VA services for mental health specifically. That has been opened back up um, to people with less than favorable discharges. Um, it's a fight because you have to fight the discharge on your forms. Um, and I, I think, and just to clarify there, the women didn't commit adultery themselves. They weren't married. Their rapist was. Yeah, so, sorry, I didn't make that. That's why I said apparently committed um, adultery. Yeah, yeah, I just, you know, for people, I yeah. just want, you know, it's like a lot to unpack when it happens. Because I know people who that have happened to. Um, they were charged with adultery and they weren't the married one. And it was like, and even if it, and consensually too, not just rape situations. Mm -hmm. Like, and it, it's like this bizarre, weird military code that has a higher repercussion than sexually harassing your colleague and that's really a lot to unpack sometimes um yeah yeah i know um again from anecdotal evidence i have um friends in the armed services um in the states um you know why you're saying that this idea of this toxic masculinity that often runs through many units um it's the idea as well of when women join the army um the idea that they're going to somehow morally corrupt the men in the army and then there's been a disproportional kind of use of adultery against females in the army usually lower ranking females than there has against the higher ranking males yeah um and you know an interesting part <laughs> and it's not just for it's not the moral so the military, I don't think, because they fully expect the men to rape everything in their sight. Um, they hand out condoms on the ship's quarter deck when you pull into port. 
So I'm just saying like their, their moral standards are really low. They, they see it more as a, uh, feminization of the military, uh, pundits like, uh, the infamous Tucker Carlson sees things like maternity uniforms as a, uh, way of making the military weaker. <laughs> um, and I'm like, they've always had maternity uniforms, you dumbass. But, um, yeah, there is a lot of fear that women will ruin the unit cohesiveness because men will try to save the woman instead of the other men, which has been disproven over and over again. Um, and there's also this fear of you're going to make it more feminized and femin female traits are seen as innately weak in the military. Um, the worst thing to be called is to be called a girl. Um, I, you know, people would be like, you're such a girl. And I'm like, well, yeah, I, technically, like, <laughs> uh, gender's non-binary now, uh, <laughs> but there's a, um, what do we want to say? It, it said, there's a demonization kind of, of anything feminine. Like, I remember I integrated the ship to females being on board. It was an all-male crew. My last ship, I was on two. Um, and they were kind of upset about things like tampons in the ship store. Um, and people showering regularly all of a sudden. And I was like, well, you don't have to shower really on my account, but I do appreciate it. Um, because this place smells like diesel anyway. Um, that, but you know, it, it's a very strange thing to see, especially if you know, for like, if you know, like I do that the reason the U S has not had a draft since Vietnam is because of women filling the ranks. Um, and that actually is a great boon to, um, politicians electorally in the U S drafts are enormously unpopular, unpopular in the United States. And, you know, as soon as uh, Russia started wilding up, I think uh, everybody started Googling draft age in, in America again. So like they did when uh, Trump and Iran started getting snippy with each other. And all of a sudden, like the biggest search is uh, draft age. So it's enormously unpopular, even though we haven't had to do it. So we're going to go, go back to uh, Erica's questions. <laughs> Um, is there any, any other questions before I move on to this? God, I have things I want to ask, but I, I can wait. I, I can be patient. I just have one more question. Sorry. Um, so do you know the statistics that come from the military population in terms of report and resulting convictions? Is that in line with what we see in the civilian population? Because reports and actually getting it to trial is phenomenally low as it is um is what I, in I, the military less or in line with the civilian population so i do not know the actual numbers for that but most uh, anecdotally i know most of the military numbers are not in line with the civilian population um in many ways so um i would probably say reports and convictions are I don't know. I would have to look um, just because the United States itself is enormously anti-woman. So it is difficult to qualify that or give an answer without actually looking up the data. Would you like so, to- sorry, sorry for my non-answer. <laughs> Would you like to follow up on that or maybe something relevant? No, I was just wondering, I didn't know um, if kind of JAG and the military courts were um, actually going to start opening up their their cases to do a proper review. But <laughs> usually when they add a new, well, they added a new statute to the book. So you would hope that they would provide an internal review and you could see if it's in line 
and could almost be put off as you know a social phenomenon that's happening in the country or if there's something really specific happening within the military services that's resulting in well, not anecdotally, just reporting. anecdotally i could say it's the military services because i've worked in both the civilian and military sectors so at least work wise it's worse in the military but i know that's not my, my experiences are not uh indicative of the whole and I, I but the thing is is it's definitely a large it's definitely been seen as a larger problem in the military but i do not have the numbers in front of me so okay um i wanted to ask you said that before someone is discharged and when they report an event um they go through a psych evaluation um are there any regular psych evaluations that must be such a dumb question um, but are there any regular psych evaluations like routine once a year once every five years that someone goes through no absolutely not great okay no, I'm so to the next question then. <laughs> That one no, like they only get psych evaluations in the military usually only occur when there has been an exhibited need for them and they generally do it for sexual assault just to make they under the guise of making sure they're okay but it's you know also like oh you're exhibiting signs of bipolar disorder but Oh my. Bipolar disorder exhibits the same signs as PTSD and ADHD and a bunch of other shit. So, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? It, it, they, they don't like to admit that PTSD is prevalent because of what's happening in the ranks. Does only the survivor go through assessment? Or the person that they, or, or the person who has committed the assault as well? Is, uh, they might have changed it, but it's my when I was in, it was just a survivor. Great. Yeah. Um, do you happen to know what the youngest age that someone can join the army is, and what is the average age of new conscripts? So I'm asking like, because if it's very young, oh, I know then your, your your brain is not done developing like by the age of by the age of twenty five or something. So how much brainwashing is happening? a lot um so as i mentioned recruiters are in high schools uh the earliest somebody can enlist in the military is 17 with their parents consent parents have to sign off on it they will know and the training process for the military is such that they will not be in combat until they're 18 likely like it is like exceedingly unlikely because they aren't allowed to leave for boot camp until after they graduate high school. So say they turn 18 in January, they can still join in November if their parents say they can. Um, so the military, I used to be a recruiter, okay? So I actually know that recruiters market towards 17 to 22 year old men, I believe is our target demographic. Um, and we like to get them young before they get fat or disabled or really into drugs or get a police record um because the older someone is the more likely they are to have drugs in their system have disabilities have kids have um common sense to say no thank you uh and part of it is recruiters are in, in the school at such an early age and military service is seen as it's not seen as a bad thing to do especially if you're in a poor school for example um and as a recruiter like the law in the united states says that if you get federal funding you have to allow recruiters in the school at least this many times a year it's a law george bush um and the richer schools will only let you in like twice a year they're like the law says twice it's twice that's it but um the schools in districts with a higher amount of poverty 
will allow you to come in as much as you want. Um, basically, uh, cause they know it's college costs essentially. That's interesting. Um, so I was just reading of a concept called the second order of sexual harassment. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it's essentially the harassment of people and structures who support survivors and they work against re-victimization, re that's in the, in the definition, and towards improving existing circumstances and legislation. Have you, do you have any general knowledge of how that might work in, in the island? The example that I was reading was about universities and um, how uh, women researchers were encouraged, were discouraged from, from discussing sexual harassment at university, but also other female researchers were discouraged towards um, speaking about their friends' experiences, how they were denied promotions for speaking about their friends' experiences how they were denied funding and jobs and scholarships and all of that. So I imagine there must be something relevant going on over there. I just don't know if there is any structure in the middle of the that. I mean, I don't know that. And I know what you're talking about. Um, I've never been told not to talk about it, but I don't really uh, listen because um, I'm too old to be uh, coerced into silly things. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's that or, you know, you reach a certain age where it's like, yep, all the, um, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to research because it matters to me. Um, and, you know, me, I have a different perspective and I'm not going to stop researching these things because it makes them uncomfortable. Um, you know, I don't know if I, you know, you've, it's hard to explain how it is when it comes to retaliation because it's sometimes subtle and sometimes not. You know, sometimes it's, you know, uh, an eval, but based on something kind of legitimate, you know, or sometimes it's, you know, <sighs> I don't, I don't actually know because I've never actually thought about it. So I'm going to have to get back to you. <laughs> that, that's perfectly fine. Like the way that I'm thinking of it right now is let's say I report sexual harassment and you defend me for reporting it. Will there be retaliation against you for defending me for reporting now? Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I got a little of it for uh, advising someone to go to the chaplain because the chain of command was screwing her. Not, it was in a different department, so I was like a little safer than her, but like, yeah, the guys gave me a lot of side eye and I don't care, you know. <laughs> oh, not, not caring is, is, is good, but that happening is still something that- Well, it's really hard to, I mean, I, I didn't care at the time and I didn't, I don't think I knew that, you know, it's one of those later on you realize that's why something happened type things like at the time you didn't really notice because it was not on your radar <laughs> and my final question is that you mentioned uh there are um uh, offenders who commit crimes in the sexual crimes crimes in the military um but they are not listed as sexual offenders when they go out and they commit the same crimes again um are the statistics on this like how, what is the percentage of people who, who leave the army who have committed such a crime then they recommit the crime outside so i don't know that there's statistics of it but i know of it through documentaries and um other media where i've seen uh secondary reports and things of that nature so there's a documentary called the invisible war um, and it talks about sexual assault in the military. And more than one person talks about, um, you, there, there's a case or two where they discuss, you know, these people get out and they're still sexual offenders. You know, they didn't get punished. They don't get added to a list because non-judicial punishment does not go on your civilian record. 
So I don't know that there's even, I don't even know how you would research that because I don't know how long they keep records for non-judicial punishment, where they would even keep them, like something that happens on the ship. Like, is it digital now? Like, what do they do with the old handwritten ones? Like, you gotta remember a lot of what happens is handwritten out in the field. Um, yeah, because I remember I've been to Captain's Mass, non-judicial punishment, where I saw someone getting brought up for whatever charges and they write it down. There's no like audio recording. It's not, it, I mean, it was like in the early 2000s too. So it's, the military is still very paper dependent. Um, so that's like one of those things, like how would you even get those numbers? Did they log them somewhere? Did they, is it even digitized? Is it, it is, that's a good question, but it's how do you get that information? And would the Freedom of Information Act even allow you to do it? Would these people's names be redacted? They would. Privacy Act stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's a good question, but one that would be difficult to accomplish. I, I'm asking because I was also reading about the, the financial cost of gender-based violence. And we're talking about millions and billions even from depending on the country and the population, how much the government is willing to, to spend and to recognize that there is a problem. But that if, I think you mentioned it was, it's about 20,000 people, more than 20,000 people who were assaulted in 2018. Yep. And that is, first of all, it's 20,000 people more than, than there should be. Uh, but still, that, there must be a rather significant cost. And maybe someone has assaulted a person. It just costs you money at this point. Like, if you don't care about a person being a person, which is terrible on its own, maybe you care about not spending money when all oh, happens. <laughs> maybe you should care the tree about. The stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> not spending money on, on, on someone who, who just commits crimes. They'll just, de they'll just deny your care. <laughs> Actually, yes. I can see that. But, but um, and you think about it, like, so here's the thing, like a lot of people don't know about the US military is probably, even though we don't get paid what we should, probably one of the better compensated militaries in the world. Um, when I was stationed in Greece, we were actually told not to leave our pay stubs out um, because the conscripts might see it. <laughs> And you know how much they don't get paid in Greece. So um, nothing, basically. They're like, here's a euro, good luck. Um, <laughs> so bad. Um, so even though we're one of the, you, you gotta think about it, um, just disability pay alone, like um, depending on your percentage, if you have a percentage of disability, the VA pays you a disability stipend every month. Just that alone, it's tax-free money. The government doesn't pay for it. Um, the therapy, uh, pills, the um, they have outside providers outside of the VA now um, because they couldn't handle the load. Um, and also, I don't like going to the VA, so it makes me happier. Um, <laughs> and the thing is, is this abuse still exists in the VA itself? Um, you can be sexually assaulted by a man at the VA, um, and the VA will do nothing. Um, yeah, uh, it's fun. So, yeah, essentially, it's a very, they, I think the way they prevent the cost is by de denying claims and or making it so uncomfortable for women to even go to the VA that we don't. Like, I don't know. I, I had a big VA kerfuffle this week. I wonder week. why oh, they I'm, do that. I'm in a mood. Um, they annoyed me because my prescription wasn't kept in stock because I'm a woman. It's a woman prescription type thing. They're like, we keep things in stock for a majority of our patients. And I'm like, so men, you stock things for men because majority of their patients are men. And they're like, no, that's not what we mean. I was like, yeah, it is. 
<laughs> sounds like it we don't have room for it oh really it's like this big you don't have room for it okay it was a it was an experience this week i was in a mood but anyway <laughs> um that was my final question um I think that when I when I rewatch the presentation, I will have some more. Uh, maybe someone else has anything to add. If not, a question, maybe maybe a comment, anything. Like I I don't know much about the U.S. Army and the comments are on it, so feel free. Anyone type anything? I can't see anything now. Okay, then I. I guess that's it. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, again, it was it was a heavy one. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, um, um, I think next time I'm going to start putting cat pictures in in between. No, no, don't. <laughs> just to, you know, a little th cat therapy in the middle. Like, I'm sorry I depressed you. Here's a kitten. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't mean that. And I didn't want to be oh no, I understand. <laughs> I, like I. I thought of it before. I'm like, should I put a kitten in here to like balance this out? Because it is really depressing information to it be honest. It is, but it's it's one of the topics that they they don't get as much attention as they should be getting in, in comparison to the consequences and the frequency. Or it's, it's, a, it's a massive problem. Um, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I don't know that I know anybody who hasn't had some kind of sexual yes. harassment or assault or even just um, gender discrimination. Like I've, I was turned down for the good evals because of my gender more than once. Um, my feedback was, it, it's clear that you're trying to get a good eval, which isn't that the purpose. The yeah. yeah yeah so studying not good things all right got it anyway but um it's it's a very widespread problem but it's, but i'm sure it's not just in the u.s military which is why i want to do a comparative study pulling in another nation but it's kind of difficult because the u.s military structurally stands alone with its how many women it's let in the ranks and the roles they fill and the fact that it's all volunteer so I have decent material on the North Korea now, I'm usually interesting. Well, <laughs> not North Korea, like South, <laughs> South Korea, because I have a lot of South Korean um, colleagues that I could definitely get on board to like mm -hmm. co-author something with me. So it's like, um, and they would be better equipped to read local news than me. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's just it's this way it is. But anyway, um, yeah, sorry, it's it's a heavy topic, but it's one that I think we need to start covering more of. Definitely. Um, so I will be stopping the recording now. Again, thank you very much for the presentation.